chapter 2.7, we're going to be going over derivatives and rates of change. So remember uh, these following facts about tangent lines and secant lines. So this first page is a little bit of a review. The tangent line is a limit of secant lines. So remember that a tangent line is going to be a line that touches the curve at only one point, and it has the same direction of the curve at that one point. So you can see down here in uh, this little graph, we have the blue curve, and then these red lines, P1 and P3, represent lines that are tangent lines. And the lines at P2, P4, and P5 are not tangent lines. So this is just review, uh, just so just remember that from previous sections. So now what we're going to do is we're going to extend this definition using a secant line. Once again, this is kind of review, but we're going to be doing it just a little bit differently uh, than what we saw before using a little bit different notation. So let's say we have this function f of x here, and let's say that we have a fixed point r, and r is going to have the coordinates a comma f of a, so this will be a, and then its y-coordinate would be f of a. And then let's say we have another point, point s, right here. And point s is going to have the coordinates x, comma, f of x. So uh, point r is fixed. It stays exactly where it is. And then we have point s. And we can go ahead and make a secant line, create a secant line between them. So a secant line is just a line going through, cutting through both of those points. So by definition, we know we can calculate the slope of that secant line. The slope of the secant line RS would be y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, which in this case would be f of x minus f of a, divided by x minus a, because those are what we had r2, x1, and x2 coordinates b. So now what we're going to do is something pretty similar here. And we are going to say that x, which is point s, point s is going to get closer and closer to point r. So x is going to get closer and closer to a. And as it gets closer and closer, that secant line is going to get closer and closer to the tangent line at point R. And we can actually see what that means visually when we click this little link here. So we have point R is the black dot on the left that's fixed. Point S is the red dot on the right that's moving. You can see as that red dot moves closer and closer to the black dot, we have this secant line between them the whole entire way. And as the red dot moves towards the black dot, it's getting closer and closer and closer to the tangent line at the black dot. So anytime we're dealing with this kind of motion, we're going to be working with limits. So the tangent line of the graph of f of x at the point a comma f of a is going to be the line through this point. And having this slope right here, the limit as x approaches a, so the x is approaching the a, the dot, the right dot is going towards the left dot. It's the limit of that slope, f of x minus f of a over x minus a. And the slope of this tangent line at this point is also called the slope of the curve at that point, and it's also called the instantaneous rate of change at that point as well. So they all represent the same thing. Now let's go ahead and find an example, or do an example here. So let's find the equation of a tangent line to the graph of f of x equals x squared at 1 comma 1, and then we're going to graph them once we're done just to see exactly what we did. So if we want the equation of a tangent line, remember that that almost always, almost always, means we're going to be using point-slope form for the equation of a line y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. So we're starting off with this, and we need we need our, our two, two things, technically kind of three things. We need our x-coordinate, our y-coordinate, and the slope. 
So we are told the x, y, right? We're told the ordered pair. It's crossing through the point 1, 1. And now we need the slope. So we need to figure out the slope. And we are going to figure this out using that definition that we just saw on the other page, which is the limit as x approaches a of f of x minus f of a over x minus a. So the a here, the a is this x coordinate. It's essentially x sub 1. It's x1 that's given to us. And then the x remains x. So it's going to be the limit as x approaches 1 of f of x minus f of 1 over x minus 1. And we need to substitute in for f of x here. So this is going to be the limit as x approaches 1. f of x is x squared. And then f of 1, f of 1 is the y coordinate. So f of 1 is right here. This is f of a, which is f of 1, which is also 1, because it's 1 squared. Okay, so it's x squared minus 1 over x minus 1. Now all we're doing is evaluating a limit, right? It's uh, the limit of x squared minus 1 over x minus 1 as x approaches a. So all we have to do here is... We, we, would we would like to just plug in 1 and do, do direct substitution, but this would give us 0 over 0. So we have to factor the numerator, x plus 1 times x minus 1 over x minus 1. The x minus 1's cancel. We get the limit as x approaches 1 of x plus 1. Now we can do direct substitution. 1 plus 1, we get 2. Okay, so that is our slope. So now we can go ahead and plug everything in here. It's going to be y minus 1 equals 2 times x minus 1. Technically, you could just leave it like that uh, because it doesn't say put it in uh, slope-intercept form, but let's just put it in slope-intercept form anyway by solving for y, distribute the 2, add 1 to both sides, we get an equation of y equals 2x minus 1, which is our equation of the tangent line. And let's just kind of go ahead and verify that with the graph. So let's go ahead and graph y equals x squared. So there's our basic uh, quadratic function, y equals x squared. And if we graph the function that we just found, we know it has to be cutting through this point, right? We're finding the equation of the tangent line through that point. We know it's y equals 2x minus 1. So y-intercept of negative 1, slope of 2, up 2 to the right 1. And that is our tangent line that we just found. And we can see that it looks like we probably did it correct because it looks pretty accurate. Okay, and I just threw in a little note here that we sometimes refer to the slope of the tangent line to the curve at the point as the slope of the curve at that point. So there's one definition of being able to find the slope of the tangent line. Now we're going to have another one. So let's say we have our function again. And it's going to be the same exact concept where we're going to have one point here and another point somewhere to the right of it. It could be to the left of it also, but we're, to the right of it's a little bit easier. So we're going to have two points. The left point is going to be fixed, and the right point is going to move closer to the left point. So a little bit different, though. Now we are going to call this point A, which is actually no different than before. But instead of this point, instead of this x value being point x, and we're moving x closer to A, we're actually going to say that this point is a certain distance away from this point. We're going to call this a distance of h units. So if something is h units away, h units to the right, we would say that that's going to be a plus h, right? If we're h units to the right of 2, it would be 2 plus h. So same thing here, a plus h. 
Okay, other than that, we're going to be doing the same thing. We're going to have a secant line between those two points. And we're going to be moving the point on the right closer and closer to the fixed point on the left. So if we wanted to calculate the slope between these two points using these x-coordinates, what we're going to do is we're going to say that the slope is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1 but uh, x2 y2 is going to be from this point here which is a plus h so it's going to be f of a plus h minus f of a which is this point right here divided by x2 minus x1 which is a plus h minus a so something that hopefully you recognize here is that the a's in the denominator cancel, right? We're left with f, we're left with this whole entire numerator unchanged, divided by only an h now, because the a's in the denominator canceled. And this is uh, something that's very important. It's called the difference quotient. Okay, so hopefully you're kind of saying, okay, why we already had the one definition, why do we have a second definition? So this definition is a little bit different other than just notation, because now if we're moving the point on the right closer and closer to the point on the left, what that means is h is approaching zero, because h is the distance between them. We're trying to close that gap, which means h is going to be approaching zero, so here's what our other definition then becomes. We have at point x equals a, the slope of the tangent line is m equals the limit as h goes to 0 of f of a plus h minus f of a all over h. Okay, so this is our second definition of the slope of the tangent line. So let's go ahead and do an example. So we want to find the equation of the tangent line to the graph of f of x equals 3 over x at 3 comma 1, and then we're going to graph it to uh, kind of make sure we did it correctly again. So once again, finding the equation of a tangent line, we are going to be using point slope form for the equation of a line. y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. And once again, we are told x1, y1. A point that it crosses through is 3 comma 1, the point that we're uh, interested in. We could have only, let's say we were only given x. If we were only given x, then we would have to find y by plugging x into the function. Okay, so that is our x1, y1, and now we need m once again, and we're going to do it using this definition that we just learned. So it's the limit as h approaches 0 of f of a plus h minus f of a all over h. And now our a value is 3. It's the x value. And that's actually uh, pretty much all that we're plugging in. So it's going to be the limit as h goes to 0 of f of 3 plus h minus f of 3 all over h. So we know that f of 3, f of 3 is 1, right? Because that's actually given to us right up here. It, that's our y value. f of 3 or f of a it equals 1. So let's go ahead and plug that in. It's the limit as h approaches 0 of something minus 1 over h. So now we have to figure out, let me move this down a little bit, now we have to figure out what f of 3 plus h is. f of 3 plus h is just f of x, except instead of an x you have 3 plus h. So instead of this x right here, we have to replace that with 3 plus h. So it's 3 over 3 plus h. Okay, so I'm actually just going to flip-flop these sides so I have more room here. Okay, so taking a look at what we have right here now, 
we can't just plug in a zero into h because then we're dividing by h. So we have to pull some uh, algebraic techniques here and we have to simplify this numerator first. So I'm gonna do this on the side. I'm gonna say, okay, we have three over three plus h minus one. So how can we simplify this? Well, what we have to do is we have to get common denominators. So getting a common denominator, it is unfortunately three plus h. So we would have to multiply one over one by three plus h over three plus h, which would give us three plus h over three plus h. Okay, now we can go ahead and combine these. When we combine them, it's gonna be three minus three plus h all over that common denominator. It's just combining, uh, adding and subtracting fractions. And now we can see that those threes cancel, right? Three minus three, distribute that negative to the h, we get negative h over three plus h. So it doesn't look like too much help yet, but let's go ahead and plug it in and see what happens. We have the limit as h approaches zero of negative h over three plus h, and this is still all over that big h at the bottom, right? So anytime you have a complex fraction, a fraction within a fraction like this, you're gonna to wanna to combine it into one fraction. This would technically be keep, change, flip. Keep the first one the, ch the same, change the multiplication, multiply by the reciprocal of the bottom one. So doing this, now you can see how this h is gonna end up in the denominator with three plus h. So when we do that, we're gonna end up getting the limit as h approaches zero of negative h over h times three plus h. And now we can see that these h's cancel off to a one. So it's going to be the limit as h approaches zero of negative one over three plus h. So the algebra for this problem is most of the work. But once you're done with that, it's pretty simple. All we have to do is plug in the zero into h, and we get negative one third, which is our slope. So let's go ahead and plug that all the way back in here. So we get y minus one equals negative one third times x minus three. Let's solve this for y again. We get y minus one equals negative one third x plus one. Add one to both sides, negative one third x plus two. So that is our equation of the tangent line. Okay, let's go ahead and graph this now. Here is our function f of x, and we want to graph that equation of the tangent line, negative one third x plus two. So that's going to be y-intercept of two, down one to the right three, cutting through this point, which gives us this line right here, and it looks pretty accurate for the equation of the tangent line at that point. So continuing on with what we just did, it brings us to derivatives. So those previous limits that we just did are given a special name and notation since we tend to use them so frequently in calculus. So the derivative of a function f at a number a is gonna be denoted like that with that little prime apostrophe. And that's going to be f prime of a equals the limit as h approaches zero of f of a plus h minus f of a all over h. And note that we read that, we read f prime of a as f prime of a, or we can read it as the derivative of f evaluated at x equals a. So that's not a, uh, it's not a one, it's not an exponent at all, it's just different, it's the derivative notation. Okay, and then we could also do it to the other one that we did when we did it first. And that's the derivative of a function f at a number a would be f prime of a equals f equals the limit of f of x minus f of a over x minus a as x approaches a. So these tell us the same exact thing, 
uh, except you'll see that sometimes it'll be easier to use one or use the other one and sometimes we're going to be told which one to use. Okay, so this is the important page pretty much if you had to name one important page these two uh, derivative limits here. Let's do an example. Let's find the derivative of the function f of x, which is x squared minus 8x plus 9 at the number a. So what we are going to do is we are going to use f prime of a. Let's go ahead and use this first definition. The limit as h approaches 0, which is f of a plus h minus f of a all over h. Okay, so typically for this one, it's going to be a pretty similar process if f of x is a polynomial, and you'll see kind of this process uh, right now. So we want the limit as h approaches 0. We really only have to do two things. We have to find f of a plus h, maybe three things. Find f of a plus h, plug in f of a, and then simplify the numerator and then go from there. So f of a plus h using f of x, plug in an a plus h everywhere that there is an x, we get a plus h squared minus 8 times a plus h plus 9. So this right here is f of a plus h. Now we need to find f of a which is as easy as just plugging in an a for x in f of x. So that's a squared minus 8a plus 9, all divided by h. Remember your goal here is to plug in a 0 for h, which means we need to cancel it in the denominator. So let's go ahead and simplify this numerator. Simplifying the numerator, first we have to do a plus h squared. Hopefully you can do the shortcut, that's a squared plus 2ah plus h squared. Next we have to distribute the negative 8. That's going to be minus 8a minus 8h and then plus that 9. And then next let's go ahead and distribute this negative into f of a. That's minus a squared plus 8a minus 9 all over h. Okay, so that's kind of the only difficult part, if uh, in my opinion, and hopefully it's not that difficult, it's just algebra. Um, so now what we're going to do is we're going to start canceling in the numerator. a squared minus a squared, negative 8a plus 8a, 9 minus 9. So what should happen if this is a polynomial is this term, this expression f of a, this function, should always cancel off with something from f of a plus h. Okay, let's see what we have left now. It's the limit as h approaches 0 to ah plus h squared minus 8h all over h. Now when we get to this point, what should happen is everything in the numerator should have an h in it. And if you want to show all steps, you could factor out an h in the numerator and get 2a plus h minus 8 left over. Now you can see that those h's cancel each other off. And remember that's kind of your goal here. So it's the limit as h goes to 0 of 2a plus h minus 8. Now we can go ahead and plug in our 0 into h. And when we do that, we get 2a plus 0 minus 8, which gives us 2a minus 8. Okay, so we just found the derivative, and I'll just put a little arrow here to make it look a little nicer. f prime of a equals 2a minus 8. Okay, so that is the derivative of our function f of x. So now let's kind of talk about uh, what this actually means. The two most common interpret interpretations of f prime of a of the derivative, so I'm going to highlight this because it's important, we should know what this represents. f prime of a, the derivative of the function, represents the slope of the tangent line when x equals a. 
So we have a derivative f prime of a. If we plug in for a, then that's going to tell us the slope of the tangent line at that point. Another way we can think of it is that it represents the instantaneous rate of change when x equals a. So slope of tangent line, instantaneous rate of change. So we're going to be doing a similar question to what we kind of already did. We're going to be using point slope form for the equation of a line. We could write point slope point excuse me, point slope form like this if we want. It it means the same exact thing as y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1, but instead of uh, x1, we're using a. Instead of m, we're using f prime of a. Instead of y1, we're using f of a. This is just the kind of function notation, better notation with the derivative. So let's go ahead and see this example. Find an equation of a tangent line to that parabola at the point 3, negative 6. So let's go ahead and use our uh, point slope form, the, the new point slope form y minus f of a equals f prime of a times x minus a. So remember, you could use the other form that we've been using. Uh, the reason why this is the good one is because this is the notation that we're pretty much going to use more of, especially with the derivative notation f prime of a. Okay, so we need two things. We need a comma f of a, which is given to us is the points 3 the point 3 negative 6 and now we need f prime of a well f prime of a this function we just did the f prime of a on the previous page we found that that was 2a minus 8 so if we didn't do that already we would have to go through and do that whole process for this but we already did so let's take advantage of it and now we need f prime of f prime of a is f prime of 3, right? Because 3 is a here. So we plug that in, and we get negative 2. So we have our two things that we need. We have um, three things. We have our f prime of a, and we have our a comma f of a. Let's go ahead and plug them into our uh, equate the point slope form over here. So it's y minus negative 6, which is y plus 6, equals negative 2, times x minus 3. You could leave it just like that. That is point slope form, or you can put it in slope intercept form by solving for y. Never hurts to put it in slope intercept form. So we distribute the negative 2. And if we subtract 6 to the right, it actually cancels with the other one. So we get y equals negative 2x. And that is our equation of the tangent line. And I, I recommend graphing both of the function and this tangent line just to make sure it works out. So the last thing we're going to be taking a look at in this section is the interpretation of the derivative as a rate of change. So typically something that we use a lot of with rate of change is something, a quantity, changing with time. So if something's changing with time, meaning our variable, our independent variable, it represents time, that means the value f prime of a is the rate at which the quantity is changing at time t equals a. So a very commonly used example for this is going to be position, velocity, acceleration. Uh, especially if you've taken physics or taking physics, you'll see this a lot uh, in that course. So let's let s of t be a position function. And that's going to represent the number of feet traveled by a car after t seconds. So t here is in seconds. It's our independent variable instead of x. Okay, so let's say that we know that s prime of 2 equals 20. What does that mean? Well, if s is position, t is seconds, that means s prime of t is going to tell us that after 2 seconds, the car is traveling at a velocity of 20 feet per second. 
So the rate of change here would be velocity. The rate of change of position is going to be uh, velocity. So we could also call this s prime of 2 equals 20. We can call s prime of 2 the instantaneous velocity at time equals 2 seconds. So here's a graph. Graphs always help. So on this graph, we have two things graphed. We have our x-axis is time, t, in seconds. Our y-axis is the position function s of t in feet. And we can see this random function that we have for it in the blue. And then when t is 2, we can see the, uh, we can see the uh, tangent line. And we would say the slope of the tangent line at this point is 20, which means that's the rate of change at that point t equals 2 on the curve s of t. Okay, so a car traveling along a road is an example of motion along a straight line, which is what we would be primarily dealing with here, straight line. And like I mentioned, we call s of t the position function because it gives the location of the, uh, of the car after t seconds. And we know that the velocity of the car tells us how fast the position of the car changes and the direction of the car. So speed, uh, if, if you haven't learned this yet, speed and velocity seem similar, right? Speed and velocity. Speed is something called a scalar quantity, which means it's only, um, it's only magnitude. Velocity is a vector quantity, which means magnitude and direction. So velocity is a uh, it tells us the direction. And the way that it tells us direction is because we can have positive or uh, negative values. Positive velocity means it's going forward. Negative means the car is going backwards. So here is the velocity as a derivative. The relationship between velocity and position is that velocity is the derivative of the position function. So we have v of a v is velocity, equals the derivative of s, s prime of a, which is going to be the limit as t approaches a of s, is, s of t minus s of a over t minus a. So this is the first definition that we saw, except we saw it as the limit as x approaches a of f of x minus f of a over x minus a. Same exact thing, right? Except instead of f of x, we have s of t, and that's pretty much it. Same thing other than that. Just different notation. Okay, so here's a our kind of last example that we're going to be doing. Another example of an object moving in a straight line is when a ball is thrown straight up into the air. So obviously we're going to be ignoring air resistance, air resistance so it's not moving back, or forth, back and forth. It's just going straight up into the air and then coming straight down. So the ball is going to initially rise up which means it's going in the positive direction, and then it's going to fall back down due to gravity, which is going to be the negative direction. So we actually have a function that can represent a, uh, a ball thrown straight up into the air, ignoring air resistance once again, is going to be s of t equals negative 16 t squared plus v naught t plus h naught. And the, the way that I'm reading that is the v sub zero h naught or v naught is just the initial velocity if you haven't taken uh, physics and then the h sub zero is the initial height so depending on the initial height you plug that in if you know it the initial velocity you plug that in if you know it also and then we just have a nice little equation here for a ball um, being thrown straight up into the air, neglecting air resistance. So let's go ahead and see an example with this. Suppose a, a ball is thrown straight up into the air with an initial height of 112 feet and an initial velocity of 96 feet per second. Let's give the equation s of t after t seconds. So pretty simple, all we have to do is use this equation. That's going to be negative 16 t squared plus 96t because that is our initial velocity plus the initial height of 112 feet. 
So now we can find out the height of this ball anytime t after we uh, throw it up in the air. So next question, how high above the ground is the ball at five seconds? Well, we can figure that out because that means t equals five, five seconds. We want the position, we want the height. We plug it in the formula here, negative 16 times five squared plus 96 times five plus 112. And that if we calculate that order of operations, we get 192 feet. So we throw a ball straight up into the air with that initial height, that initial velocity. After five seconds, it will be 192 feet high. Okay, last question here is what is the velocity of the ball at five seconds? So based on the previous page, we said that V of A, so we want the velocity after five seconds, V of A equals S prime of A, which is the limit as T approaches A of S of T minus S of A over T minus A. So A here is five. A is five seconds. So that means V of five is going to equal s prime of 5. I'm just not going to write that down. So it's the limit as t approaches 5 of s of t minus s of 5 over t minus 5. And we go ahead and do exactly what we did previously. We're going to substitute in, instead of s of t, we're actually going to write the function in now. The function is negative 16 t squared plus 96t plus 112 and then it's going to be minus s of 5. s of 5 is 192 because we just found that out in the previous example. Just plugged it in the function and this is going to be all over uh, t minus 5. Okay so our goal here is to plug in 5 into t we can't do that right away because we get 5 minus 5, which is 0 in the denominator. So let's take care of this numerator and probably factor afterwards and see what happens. I'm just going to reposition this so I have more room. Okay, so in this numerator, we can actually simplify a little bit, right? We can uh, combine these two terms right here, 112 minus 192. So we get negative 16t squared plus 96t minus 80 for t minus 5. Still doesn't look like uh, anything good is happening, but what we can do now is we can factor out a negative 16 in the numerator. And if we do that, we're left with t squared minus 6t t plus 5, so GCF, and now we can see that this remaining quadratic in here with the coefficient of 1 on the t squared term can be factored, and it can be factored as, can be factored as uh, t minus 5 times t minus 1, which is great because now we can cancel off the t minus 5 in the denominator, right? Cancel, cancel. And then what we have left, what we have left here is limit as t approaches 5 of negative 16 times t minus 1. So all we have to do now is plug in our 5 into t. And it's a little messy, I'll fix this afterwards. We plug that in and we get negative 64. So we need to figure out what that actually means. Remember, we found the velocity when t is five seconds. And that means 
after at t equals five seconds, the instantaneous velocity or uh, the the slope of the tangent line is uh, the ball is falling downward at a speed of 64 feet per second. So the negative value here means it's traveling down. It's coming back towards the ground at 64 feet per second. So S was in feet and T was in seconds, so velocities in feet per second. Okay, so that is it for this section.